to Live Parkinson's, Live an Exceptional Life. I'm your host, Chris Kustenbotter, and I've been living with Parkinson's for the past 13 years. The mission of this podcast is to help as many people living with Parkinson's as possible lead a great quality of life. The topic of this episode is nutritious Parkinson's meal plans and tips for improved quality of life. We'll look at the four key components of a nutritious meal plan for Parkinson's patients. First, we'll understand the nutritional needs for Parkinson's essential nutrients and food groups. We'll look at practical meal planning strategies, recipes, and menu planning ideas. And then we'll close out with managing challenges and promoting healthy habits. Now, before we dive into today's topic, I have a brief disclaimer I want to go over, and that is this program is not intended to diagnose or treat Parkinson's disease. Please follow the treatment plan provided by your healthcare professional. The information being provided is based on my own personal experiences and research and should be used for informational purposes only. Are you confused about your diet and nutrition if you're living with Parkinson's? Are you asking yourself, what food should I be eating to help me stay active and healthy? Then this podcast is for you. Let's start out by understanding the nutritional needs for Parkinson's and what some of the essential nutrients and food groups are. And let's start by going over macronutrients and micronutrients. You might have heard these terms when you're watching TV and you, know, you see the commercials on TV. So what exactly are macronutrients? There are actually three macronutrients that we need in our diet, and they consist of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. And then the micronutrients are vitamins and minerals. So let's take a look at proteins first. Proteins are an essential block of life and play an essential role in managing the overall health and our own well-being. Proteins form the structural framework of our bodies, from both our muscles and tissues to our bones and cartilage. They're also the building blocks for a lot of the functions in our body that we need to live a healthy life. These include hormones, enzymes, and other molecules that regulate body functions. Now, a balanced Parkinson's diet is rich in protein and can help maintain your muscle mass, support metabolic processes, and contribute to a healthy immune system. So what are some good sources of lean protein that we should include in our diet if we have Parkinson's disease? You want to eat these lean proteins because they offer a host of nutrients without adding a lot of saturated fats. Keep in mind, we want to try to keep our saturated fats down. So what are some of the proteins that are good options for people with Parkinson's? Poultry, which would include chicken or turkey. Fish beans and legumes, which are kidney beans, black beans, pinto beans, edamame. These are all good options for beans and legumes. Nuts and seeds, which includes walnuts, almonds, chai seeds, and pumpkin and sunflower seeds. And then low-fat dairy, and that would include cottage cheese and Greek yogurt. Those would be all great sources of proteins to include in your Parkinson's diet. Now, the second macronutrient is fats, and fats often get a bad rap. We often hear you shouldn't eat fats because they're they're bad for you. They're going to help you gain weight, but fats are an essential part of our our diet. They help contribute to our brain health, and healthy fats are especially important for people with Parkinson's. So there's different types of fats, which we're going to go into in just a moment, but part of a key Parkinson's diet, they help to support our brain function. They help to reduce inflammation. And when we're talking about inflammation, that that can be any type of inflammation in the body, which can lead to certain things like atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. This is inflammation of cells and things in the body that we're talking about. And then it can help with improved mood and cognitive function, which are important in people with Parkinson's. And it can help protect the nervous system. Now, fats can be divided into two different types, polyunsaturated and monounsaturated. Polyunsaturated fats include your omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, and these are two essential fatty acids that our bodies cannot produce and that we need to include in our diet. Monosaturated fats, on the other hand, are those foods that you can find in olive oil and avocados, and they're also beneficial for our health. Some examples of foods containing omega-3 fatty acids would be your fatty fish, and these would include salmon, tuna, mackerel, and sardines. Chai seeds are another source of omega-3 fatty acids. A lot of times I'll throw these into cottage cheese. I'll mix cottage cheese and and Greek yogurt together and then put uh, chai seeds in there as well to add some omega-3 fatty acids. And then walnuts are another great option. 
A lot of times people put walnuts and cookies, but they're also great in if you're mixing it with yogurt or if you're having some berries and maybe some cheese, That that's a good option as well. So the, the, those would be your omega-3 fatty acids. And then omega-6 fatty acids would include nuts and seeds, uh, almonds, walnuts, and chai seeds. I love to, to eat some almonds sometimes in the afternoon when I'm hungry because it helps to keep you satisfied until dinner. And then vegetable oils are another great source of omega-6 fatty acids. Now, when you're choosing fatty acids, it's important to limit your intake of saturated and trans fats. You hear a lot of this on the news. They talk about trans fats. They talk about saturated fats. Saturated fats are the ones found in animal products, such as your red meat. Beef has a lot of saturated fat, depending on the cut. You know, there's a lot of different fatty cuts of beef. Butter and full-fat dairy products are other sources of products that have high saturated fat content. A lot of people with heart issues are told to limit the amount of saturated fat they that they consume. So it's important to understand that what where you can find saturated fats and how you can help cut those out of your diet. And then the other ones are trans fats. And we hear we've heard a lot about trans fats and a lot of times we're not really sure what they are, but trans fats are used in processed foods such as your fried foods, baked goods and margarine. And a lot of times what they're used for is to help extend the shelf life of products. Have you ever wondered why you see some of these baked goods sitting on the shelf and they, they have a, a really extended shelf lives. And one of the reasons for that is they use trans fats to help extend the shelf life of the product. And then moving on to the third macronutrient, which is carbohydrates. And they're also a key component of a Parkinson's diet. And they serve as the primary source of energy for our diet. They produce the fuel needed for all our bodily functions, including physical activity in our brain function. And carbohydrates can be divided into two types, simple carbohydrates and complex carbohydrates. Simple carbohydrates are those carbohydrates that are digested quickly and absorbed into the bloodstream and cause a rapid spike in your blood sugar. These include white bread and sugar as examples. And one of the reasons they talk about not eating a lot of white bread is because it'll spike your insulin levels and that can cause weight gain and other issues as well. Inflammation, sugar is another bad actor in that it leads to inflammation and it quickly causes spikes in blood sugar, which can again cause weight gain. And for those of you that like to eat a lot of sugar, I'm just as guilty as, as the rest of them. There, there are a lot of foods that contain large amounts of sugar that a lot of times we don't think about. These would a lot of times would include some of your condiments, ketchup, is one of those barbecue sauces. A lot of the stir fry sauces that you use for making stir fries contain a lot of sugar. So it's important to try to identify those products that contain a lot of sugar and try to limit the, the sugar. For instance, cereals. A lot of the cereals have anywhere from eight grams of sugar. I've seen up to 15 to 18 grams of sugar. So it's usually recommended to try to keep the amount of sugar, especially in those types of products, at five grams or, or less. And the other type of a carbohydrate is the complex carbohydrates. And these are digested more slowly and they provide a more sustained release of energy and they help to regulate your blood sugar levels. These would include your whole grains and your fruits and vegetables. One of the best options that you can choose or some of the best options you can choose for complex carbohydrates are your whole grain breads and pastas. And then your vegetables. You've often heard that you can eat as many fruits and vegetables as you like on a diet because it's it's you're going to get full a lot quicker and it's, it's going to contain a lot of fiber, which is also going to help with issues such as constipation that many people with Parkinson's experience. So it's important to choose complex carbohydrates over simple carbohydrates. And, and again, those are some good examples. The breads, and pastas that contain whole grains. So you want to focus on whole grains rather than enriched or bleached. A lot of times white bread contains bleached white flour. So those are some things that you want to focus on. And then by incorporating complex carbohydrates into your diet, you can help improve your overall health and your well-being. You can manage your Parkinson's symptoms and help reduce your risk of developing some chronic diseases. So the three macronutrients, again, are proteins, and those would include your dairy products, your cheese, 
talked about fish and meats, lean pro- lean proteins such as poultry and fish. And then you have fats, and they're an essential part of your body. And we, we looked at what the difference was between essential fatty acids and saturated and trans fats. And then the last is carbohydrates. Now, a lot of times people get confused with the difference between what a carbohydrate and what a protein are. And the simplest way I try to, to break it down, and it's not always 100%, but proteins walk on the ground and carbohydrates grow in the ground. So if you think of chickens and turkeys, they walk on the ground. Now, of course, fish swim in water, but the other beef is a protein. Dairy, which comes from, milk comes from cows, that those all walk on the ground. And then you have carbohydrates, which grow in the ground. That would be your wheat, oats, oatmeal is another good source of complex carbohydrates. And then your fruits and vegetables grow in the ground. So an easy way to differentiate between proteins and carbohydrates, again, is Proteins walk on the ground, carbohydrates grow in the ground. So those are the macronutrients. Let's take a look now at the micronutrients. And what are micronutrients? Well, they're vitamins and minerals. Let's start with vitamins. People take vitamins as a supplement, and whether it be vitamin C, some people take vitamin A, and there's different types of vitamins. There's fat-soluble and there's water-soluble vitamins. And it's important to know the difference because if you take too many fat-soluble vitamins, they're going to be stored in the fat in the body and can cause some some issues. So you're going to want to make sure that you, when you're taking vitamins, that you review that with your healthcare professional to make sure that you're taking both the appropriate kind and the appropriate quantities of vitamins. And vitamins are what they are is essentially they're they're compounds that the body cannot produce on its own, and they must be obtained from food and supplements. And some of the most important vitamins for people with Parkinson's, and that should be included in the Parkinson's diet, would include vit- number one, vitamin D. Vitamin D plays a role in both your calcium absorption and your bone health. For people that as they as we age, I know I'm in my 60s, and one of the things that they talk about is making sure you get adequate amounts of calcium to help prevent osteoporosis. So a lot of times you'll see women are told when they go to see their physician to take calcium and vitamin D to help, especially if they're at high risk for osteoporosis. So it's important in both bone health and for calcium absorption. And it may help protect against a cognitive decline in dementia as well, which are common issues in people with Parkinson's. Some good sources of vitamin D would include your fatty fish, which we talked about earlier. That would be salmon, tuna, mackerel, and sardines, eggs. I don't know about you, but I love eggs. I, what, I don't, it doesn't matter what kind. I just I really enjoy eggs, whether they're scrambled, whether they're in an omelet or hard-boiled. It doesn't matter. I think eggs are a, a great source of both vitamin D and they're a great source of protein as well. And then fortified milk. When you go to the store, a lot of you'll see milk that's it's fortified with vitamin D, and one of the reasons is it's gonna it's one of the key vitamins that's really gonna help with your bone health. And then one of the ways that you can help ensure that you're getting enough vitamin D is to spend time outside and get exposed to sunlight, because when you're exposed to adequate amounts of sunlight, your body can help uh, synthesize vitamin D. So it's important that even in the winter time that you go outside and get adequate amounts of sunlight. The second vitamin I wanted to go over was vitamin C, and we've all heard of vitamin C when we're familiar with it from a lot of your citrus fruits. You know that oranges and lemons and limes and grapefruits all have adequate amounts of vitamin C, but there are other fruits and vegetables that have vitamin C as well. Strawberries are are another good example, and any type of berry, really, Uh, raspberries, blueberries, blackberries. I love all the berries. I love getting different types of berries and mixing them together. They also make great smoothies. If you're making a smoothie, throw in the throw the berries in there to get your vitamin C. So why is vitamin C important? Well, it's an antioxidant. And what are antioxidants? Well, they help protect cells from cellular damage, or what you you might have heard of free radicals. So they help protect against damage of your cells from free radicals that are floating around in your body. And it may also help to improve your immune function and reduce inflammation. So vitamin C is an important vitamin that we need to make sure that we're getting in our diets. And some good sources of vitamin C would include your citrus fruits, which I just talked about, as well as your berries, broccoli, and bell peppers, which are great sources of vitamin C. 
So make sure that you get your vitamin C to help to reduce the free radical damage, but also help to improve your immune function and reduce inflammation. And then vitamin E, it's another antioxidant that helps protect cells from damage. And it also helps improve cognitive function and helps it reduce the risk of falls. So what are some good sources of vitamin E? Vitamin E would include nuts, seeds, and leafy green vegetables. They're great sources of vitamin E to include in your Parkinson's diet. So three of the ones that you want to make sure that you get are vitamin D, vitamin C, and vitamin E. Those are your key vitamins. Now let's take a look at the minerals. Minerals are compounds that are essential for various bodily functions. And some of the most important minerals for people with Parkinson's to include in their diet would be, number one, would be calcium. Calcium is important for bone health and muscle function. And it also helps to reduce the risk of osteoporosis, which is a common complication in Parkinson's disease. Talk, just talked about that earlier. Some good sources of calcium would include your dairy products. So these would include fortified milk. If you get cottage cheese or yogurt, they're also great sources of calcium. Green leafy vegetables, especially the cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower are some good examples. And, and then fortified foods such as orange juice. A lot of manufacturers now will fortify orange juice with calcium and then cereal as well. So those are some great sources of calcium. And again, it's needed. It's one of those minerals that you need to help with bone health and muscle function. And then magnesium. Now, magnesium is involved in over 300 biochemical reactions in the body, and it can help to improve your muscle function, reduce cramps, and regulate your blood sugar levels. And some good sources of magnesium include your nuts and seeds, beans, and now we talked about those, black beans, kidney beans, pinto beans, navy beans. Beans are a great source of protein as well to include in your diet, and they help keep you full, and they also contain a lot of fiber, which again is going to help with constipation. And then green leafy vegetables are another source. Another key mineral is iron. And iron is important for carrying oxygen throughout the body. So iron helps your, your red blood cells carry oxygen. And it may also help to improve your cognitive function in people with Parkinson's. Some good sources include meat, and that would include red meat as a, a great source of iron. Poultry, that's your chicken and turkey. Fish, again, your beans. And then iron-fortified foods such as cereal and bread. A lot of times so manufacturers now will, will fortify bread and cereals with iron. Now, if you have any concerns about your vitamin or mineral intake, make sure you talk to your doctor and they can help you create a personalized plan to consume vitamins that are getting you the nutrients that you need. So if you have any questions on those, make sure you see, talk to either a registered dietitian or another healthcare professional. But those are the three macronutrients. And again, they're proteins fats, and carbohydrates, and then again, the micronutrients are your vitamins and minerals. Now that we understand ma the macro micronutrients and which of those are important in our Parkinson's diet, let's turn our attention to tailoring some of the meal plans to meet our individual needs. Now, meal plans should be tailored to meet the specific needs and preferences of each of the individuals with Parkinson's. So what are some things that we should consider when we're developing our meal plans and our diet for Parkinson's? Well, one of the first things is symptom severity. Individuals with more severe symptoms may require softer and easier foods to eat. So depending on the, your stage of Parkinson's and where you're at, you're going to tailor your diet and your meal plans to address those needs, those specific needs. Another one is what are some of your dietary restrictions? Do you have allergies to certain foods or do you have intolerances to certain foods? So those are some of the, the key things that you need to think about as well. And then the final piece would be looking at your lifestyle. Meal plans should fit into your lifestyle and individual's daily routine and your preferences. So what are the things that you like to do? And are you a person that likes to be on the move and you don't have a lot of time to sit down and eat? Or are you a person that likes to, you really enjoy the whole process of planning your meal, cooking your meal and sitting down and and enjoying your meal. So those are types of things that you need to consider when you're putting your, your menu and your meal planning together. So let's take a look at meal planning. Meal planning can offer several benefits to a person with Parkinson's. First is it reduces decision fatigue. 
And what do I mean by that? I went to a, several conferences and symposium and they talk about decision fatigue. And what that is, is, is as Parkinson's progresses, if you give people too many choices, they don't make any choices. So instead of saying, what would you like to have to eat today? Or what, what do you want to wear today? Say, would you like to eat some salmon with some brown rice and vegetables today? Those would be examples of give them the choice. Would you rather eat salmon or would you eat chicken? So don't give them, well, would you rather eat fish? Would you rather have pasta? Would you rather have red meat? It just gives them too many choices and then they get decision fatigue and they don't, they don't make any decision. So it's important to try to limit the decisions to help prevent decision fatigue. Another one, it, it encourages healthy eating habits. Planning meals ensures that you have nu nutritious foods. So one of the things they tell you is to make a grocery list before you go to the grocery store. Because if you don't, a lot of times what you do is you'll start walking up and down the aisles and you say, wow, those cookies look really good. Or, oh, that's on sale. Those crackers or that cake and pie looks really good. So you might put that in your cart and it might not be the best nutritious option for you. So the same goes with meal planning. Try to prepare your meal plans to include healthy options like the ones we talked about, your lean proteins, chicken, turkey, fish, and beans and, and legumes. And then make sure you get your healthy fats. If you don't like avocados, you know, use olive oil and some other things to help get your healthy fats. And then as you're meal planning as well, make sure you pick out like your complex carbohydrates, oatmeal, brown rice, whole grains, whether it's whole grain pasta and bread. So make sure you include those and then lots of fruits and vegetables too. And a lot of times you'll hear dietitians say, eat the colors, eat a colorful diet. And that would include, make sure you eat things like different colored pe bell peppers. Bell peppers are high in vitamin C, which we talked about as a, an important component. So when you're selecting, try to eat as a wide range of colors. You know, berries come in reds and blues and purples. Uh, same with vegetables. You have green vegetables. You have your orange vegetables like carrots. And then you have your yellow vegetables, some the squashes and some things like that. They're all great options and they're also loaded with fiber. So as you're developing your, your menu and your meal plan, try to include lots of colors and then make sure you pick things that are high in protein, contain the the good fats, and then also contain your complex carbohydrates. Now, one of the things I did want to mention is when you're, that I forgot to mention earlier as well, is when you're eating protein, it's important not to eat a lot of protein when you take your carbidopa levodopa because proteins can block the absorption of the carbidopa or levodopa, which may affect your your symptoms. And then the, the last piece of meal planning is keep it simple. Meal planning helps simplify your whole food preparation because you really know what you're you're going to be eating and you by planning ahead, it saves you time and energy in the kitchen. So let's talk about creating a personalized meal plan. First of all, assess your needs. Consider your symptom severity, your diet restrictions, and your lifestyle factors. Then set some realistic goals. Start with small achievable goals and then you gradually increase the complexity of your, your meal plans. And then one of the things you might want to consider is seeking the guidance of a registered dietitian or your healthcare professional to help provide personalized recommendations. So what are some tips for simplifying your meal preparation? Well, one is use pre-chopped vegetables. That's a great way to save both time in the kitchen. And if you're like me, fumble fingers, next thing you know, I'm cutting myself as I'm chopping vegetables. So one of the ways to help prevent that is to buy pre-cut vegetables. Now my my son is a chef, so he's great at cutting vegetables really quick without cutting his fingers. But I usually cutting vegetables, especially some of your harder vegetables like carrots and potatoes and those type of things really take me a, a long time to do. And so they're going to save you both time and money. And you can use some kitchen gadgets as well to help with if you don't want to go out and buy pre-chopped vegetables, which can be a little more expensive. Um, I have a little handheld ninja that I can put some vegetables in and use that to cut and slice, or you can use a food processor to help you cut, slice, dice your vegetables. And then consider using one pot meals. And what you do is you throw all your ingredients in a single pot and away you go. I do some simple 
one pot meals. One I call it's called Mexican chicken, where I essentially just put some chicken. I sprinkle it with taco seasoning, and then I take cream of chicken soup and salsa and mix that together, and I I pour that on top, and then I put it over some whole grain rice when it's done cooking at the end of the day. So that's a real simple four ingredient one pot meal that I can do. Another one pot meal is soup. You can throw different ingredients in and you can make soup in a crock pot. That's a great way where you throw lots of different vegetables in there as well as some lean proteins. You might want to throw chicken or turkey or something in there and then just use some of the broths or stocks that you can purchase at the store, whether it be chicken, turkey, beef stock. There's a lot of great stocks out there that you can use to help your one pot meals. You can do spaghetti or things like that in your, in the crock pot or stews. They're all great one pot meals. You throw in some lean roast and then you throw some vegetables in there like carrots and celery and potato. And then you just let that cook all day. And then when you come home at the end of the day, you've got your meal and then you also have easy cleanup, especially if you use things like uh, those slow pot cooker bags that are they're easy to help at the end of the day. And you pull them out when you're done and you throw them away. So Slow cookers in one pot meals kind of go hand in hand, so you can prepare your meals ahead by using a crock pot or a slow cooker. Another thing you can do is you can batch and, and cook and freeze your products ahead of time. So if, you, if you're busy during the week, maybe Sunday you make several different meals and you, you batch them together and then you can freeze them for later and then just pull them out and thaw them out and they're ready to go. So there's a lot of different ways to reduce both the time and as well as include in, in those meals nutritious ingredients. And so let's talk now about some of the recipes and menu planning ideas. So what are some easy to follow recipes that can help give you the balanced diet that you need if you're living with Parkinson's? First, what we'll do is we'll provide a few examples and then give you a, a sample weekly menu. So an example of an easy to follow recipe would be salmon with roasted vegetables. Salmon's going to be one of your lean proteins. And then roasted vegetables are going to give you the fiber. And we talked about calcium and vitamins and minerals, which are going to be important antioxidants. And the fish is also going to give you the essential fat that you need as well in your in your diet. So this this dish, so it's salmon with roasted vegetables, and it's packed with protein and healthy fats. And the, the roasted vegetables are going to add your, your fiber and your vitamins. So essentially, go to the store and ask for maybe a four-ounce piece of salmon. You can add any spices that you want to, to suit your taste. And then put a little bit of meat. You might want to drizzle a little bit of olive oil on the top, but then take your vegetables that you might either, whether you pre-chop or whether you you bought them ready to serve, it put, pour, put some olive oil on there as well as spices and then put it in the oven on a pan and roast it at about 400 degrees for 15 to 20 minutes, and then you have yourself a good meal. Another would be one pan chicken fajitas. And this recipe includes both your protein from your chicken, healthy fats from avocados and whole grains and, and vitamins and minerals. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a, a chicken breast and you can buy the pre-cut strips as well. But if you don't want to do that, you you can slice your chicken into into small strips and then take bell peppers and onions or any of your other favorite vegetables and add your favorite seasonings. Again, add some olive oil as your, one of your fats. And, and and then what you're going to do is, again, put it in the oven and roast it for at around 400 degrees until it's done. And then you can serve it with whole wheat tortillas and with some salsa and guacamole. That's going to give you your, your fats and it's going to give you your vitamins and minerals from the tomatoes, uh, vitamin C from the tomatoes found in the salsa. And then finally, it, as another example, would be an egg scramble with spinach and cheese. The eggs are going to give you your protein, and the spinach is going to give you your vitamins and minerals. And then the cheese, of course, is going to give you protein as well, as well as calcium, which we talked about as being important. So, again, what you can do is saute some spinach scramble some eggs, put the, uh, scramble the eggs with the spinach and then add cheese and voila, you have yourself a simple nutritious meal that includes the macro and micronutrients that you need. Let's look at now what a sample weekly menu plan might be. Tr try to give you some clarity on 
hey, I'm developing a, a meal plan. What are some types of things that I need to include? So let's start with day one. We'll, we'll look at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So for breakfast on day one, you might want to make oatmeal with some berries and nuts. Again, oatmeal is your complex carbohydrate. And with your berries and nuts, they're going to give you the antioxidant and they're going to give you some of the essential vitamins and minerals you need as well. For lunch, you could do a chicken salad sandwich on whole wheat bread. And then for dinner, we talked about the salmon with roasted vegetables. And then for a snack, you can have a fruit salad. That's a great way for you to get your vitamins as well and some fiber in your diet. Day two, breakfast, you could do scrambled eggs with spinach and cheese. Lunch, make a tuna salad sandwich on whole wheat bread again. And then dinner, you can make a lentil soup with a whole wheat roll. And lentil soup is easy to make. Lentils are good, great source of fiber. And they also come in different varieties. There's red lentils and yellow lentils. So there's a lot of different lentils out there. But lentils are a great way to keep the fats down, but they also provide a lot of fiber. And they, they also taste good as well. And then include a whole wheat roll with that. And then for a snack, some yogurt with granola would be a, a good snack. Day three for breakfast, have some Greek yogurt with fruit and granola. The Greek yogurt is going to give you the protein and the fruits are going to give you your vitamin C and some of the minerals and the antioxidants that you need. For lunch, you could have some leftover lentil soup if you want to reduce the, the time you're spending on your menu plan. And then for dinner, turkey stir fry with vegetables and brown rice would be a great option. And again, that's very simple. Add a little bit of olive oil to a, a hot pan and then cook your turkey and then set it aside and then stir fry your vegetables, throw your the turkey back in and then there's a, a great number of different stir fry sauces that you can use. But again, try to pick ones that are low in sugar. And then for a snack, cottage cheese with fruit would be a great option. Day four, breakfast, whole wheat toast on with avocado and tomato are great. You, know, you have your complex carbohydrates, avocado for the fat, and tomato for your vitamin C and other minerals. Lunch, you can have a salad with grilled chicken. That's going to give you both your protein with the chicken as well as your vegetables. And when you when you have a salad, make sure you, you include in there throw some nuts or berries in there sometimes that or sliced citrus fruit apples are another good option so be creative with your when you're making a salad it, it's try to cover a lot of the different fruits and vegetables you can make different types of salad but and then also when you're selecting dressings try to pick the ones that aren't real high in saturated fat and that are also not loaded with sugar and then for dinner the chicken fajitas with the whole wheat uh, tortillas that we talked about, and then for a snack, some vegetable sticks with hummus. Hummus is chickpeas, and that, that's a great uh, source of fiber as, as well. And then day five, for breakfast, make yourself a smoothie with some protein powder, uh, spinach. You can throw a banana and use some almond milk as, as something different as well. So they're great ways to get your, your protein, your vitamins and minerals and bananas are high in potassium as well. And then for lunch, uh, black bean soup with whole wheat crackers is a great option. Uh, if you like black bean, I love black beans, so it's, um, black bean soup is a great way to uh, get lots of fiber, and then you've got some protein in there as well, and the whole wheat crackers for your, your complex carbohydrates. And then for dinner, uh, some type of baked fix, fish with roasted sweet potatoes and broccoli. Sweet potatoes are a, a great source of antioxidants and fiber as well, as well as broccoli, and that's going to give you some calcium as well. And then uh, for a snack, trail mix with seeds, nuts, and dried fruit. Day six, eggs benedict with whole wheat English muffin. If you don't like the hollandaise sauce, just if you like poached eggs, put some Canadian bacon. You can use a piece of cheese if you'd like and put that on some whole wheat English muffins. That's a great uh, breakfast, great nutritious breakfast. Uh, for lunch, you could do chicken or vegetable wrap with lettuce, tomato, and avocado to give you some some fats. And then for dinner, vegetarian chili with whole wheat roll. And then for snack, popcorn. And then 
Finally, day seven, at the end of your week, you could have pancakes with fruit and yogurt. Maybe try something unique. Try moldy green pancakes or try oat pancakes. There's also pancakes out there that are loaded with protein. So protein pancakes are another great option. For lunch, leftover vegetarian chili to make things easy. And then for dinner, uh, roasted chicken with mashed potatoes and green beans. A lot of times you can go to the store and, and buy and purchase a chicken that's already been roasted and you're you're all set for dinner if you just make some mashed potatoes and some green beans. And then finally for a snack, some ice cream with fruit and nuts. Now this is just a sample menu plan and you can adjust you can adjust it to your individual preferences and needs. But it's important to consult with a registered dietitian or healthcare provider for your for personalized meal plan recommendations. So one of the reasons that I wanted to, to go over this is, especially with the, you know, a lot of the things that we do or every year as we make New Year's resolutions, I want to lose weight. And, and that's one of the things I talked about in my last podcast, my weight loss journey, which I'm going to be talking about in a new U- YouTube channel. But well, a lot of times we're confused, where do we start or how do I create a meal plan? So that's one of the reasons that and nutrition is one of the key strategies that I've been using to kind of help me live with Parkinson's for the past 13 years and and still lead a great quality of life. So by eating a balanced, nutritious diet, it's going to help you stay healthy and active. So let's close by looking at some of the um, nutritional challenges that people with Parkinson's have and how we can promote healthy habits. So what are some of the common challenges that we might face when we're planning meals and eating a nutritious, balanced diet? Well, one is loss of appetite. Parkinson's can decrease your appetite and making it difficult to consume enough calories and nutrients. So we want to make sure that we're including foods that we enjoy, but that are going to be full of nutritious foods so that if we don't eat as, as much, we're still getting the nutrients that we, that we need in our diet. Uh, fatigue. Fatigue can be another one, and it can make it challenging to prepare meals and eat healthy. And fatigue is more than just I'm tired. Fatigue is a sense of struggling just to do daily tasks. So if you're struggling with fatigue, it's important that you mention that to your healthcare provider so that they can help you address ways to overcome fatigue. But fatigue can be a, a real detrimental, have a real detrimental impact on your meal planning as well. Another challenge is tremors and rigidity. These can make it difficult both to eat and swallow. Now, they do make different utensils and things that can help you with tremors to help you when you're eating and and drinking. For instance, they make coffee cups with rounded rims to prevent spillage, but they also make spoons and forks and other utensils that that are either weighted or will move back and forth to help overcome tremors. And then in terms of if you're having problems eating and swallowing, it's important that you see a speech therapist because they can help you with some strategies to help with swallowing. And then finally, constipation. Constipation is a very common challenge in people with Parkinson's, and it can be worsened by poor dietary choices. So by eating lots of fruits and vegetables and other foods that are high in fiber, it's going to help offset some of the challenges that you may have with constipation. So make sure that you include foods that contain a lot of fiber and that's going to help you with constipation and when when you're developing your meal plans. So what are some strategies to overcome these common challenges? For loss of appetite, you can eat small frequent meals and this can help improve your appetite and your energy levels. So instead of eating three large meals a day, you might want to consider eating six small meals because that can help with both your loss of appetite and your energy level. And then you want to incorporate high calorie, nutrient dense foods. These are going to help provide the nutrition that you need in smaller portions. So again, if you're if you're eating a lot of nutrient dense foods like fruits and vegetables and your lean proteins and some of the fortified foods that we talked about with vitamin D and some other things, they're going to help give you the nutrition you need where you don't have to eat large quantities of food and able to be able to get those important vitamins, minerals, and macronutrients and micronutrients in your diet. 
can use assistive devices, which I just talked about with tremors and rigidity. There's a lot of different items out there that you can help. Weighted plates is another example that can help you with tremors. While I, I mentioned going to a speech therapist to help you come up with strategies to teach swallowing techniques, which can help you manage a dysphagia. Another one is stay hydrated. Drinking plenty of fluids can help prevent constipation, so it's important that you stay hydrated throughout the day by drinking plenty of particularly water. You want to stay away from the sugary drinks and sodas. And then promoting healthy habits. You make sure you involve your friends and your family and ask for help in meal planning preparation. So stay hydrated, eat a colorful diet, eat a diet with lots of fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, healthy fats, and complex carbohydrates. In conclusion, we talked about the three macronutrients, which are proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, and make sure you get those in your diet and make sure you, you choose good choices there. And then vitamins and minerals we talked about as your micronutrients, and those are important for a lot of your bodily functions bone health, cognitive function, and a lot of your bodily processes. So they're important to include in your diet. And then make sure that you keep things simple, limit the choices, and select healthy, wholesome foods that are going to balance out your nutrition. And experiment with different recipes and meal plans as you're developing your, your weekly or daily meal plan. So make sure you include a, a lot of different fruits and vegetables. And don't be afraid to try something new, whether it be hummus, it could be lentils. There's a lot of different foods out there that people, a lot of times, oh, I don't want to eat that. But if you give it a try, you might find that you really like it. And so make sure that you go and, and do that. So as we close out, I'd like to thank you for listening to today's program. And one of the reasons, like, again, that I wanted to touch on nutrition is I'm going to be starting a YouTube channel called The Parkinson's Live an Exceptional Life. But one of the things I really want to focus on at the beginning to, with, to help improve people's quality of lives is one of the things I've struggled with my entire life is, is weight weight gain, which, again, I just turned 60 this year. And I, I want to be around for my family and I want to stay active and prevent weight-related diseases. So eating a nutritious diet and a balanced diet is, is really important for me. And I wanted to share what I've learned with all of you. And as I close, I would request that you please go to liveparkinsons.com and sign up for the free newsletter. And there's a host of different articles on there that can help you lead a great quality of life as well. And one of the articles, if you have questions on what a good diet is, Five Must Eat Parkinson's Food for a Healthy Parkinson's Diet is one of the most recent articles that I wrote. So it's a great uh, resource. And I also have one on there on overcoming fatigue as well. If you're interested in learning more about the four strategies that I use to help live an exceptional life with Parkinson's the past 13 years, I check out my book on Amazon. It's called Spectacular Life, Four Strategies for Living with Parkinson's, My Journey to Happiness. And also, I'd love to hear from you on topics that you'd like to hear or some of your success stories. So please leave a message at podinbox.com slash live Parkinson's and I'll be happy to get back to you, but I'd love to hear your success stories. Thanks again for listening to this podcast and I hope that you can join me on future podcasts. Have a spectacular day.